Hello there, my name is David Thompson from the Freezer Valley in British Columbia. And in this video, I'm responding to a debate that the atheist Christopher Hitchens had with John Lennox. Now, I have done two other videos that were hastily prepared and were, I didn't really communicate effectively because I was coughing a lot from uh, probably what was influenza. I still got a slight bit of a cough, but it's greatly reduced now. And so I thought I'd do a really refined version and do it in a different way. So the presentation will be different and there will be some evidence that is different in this video. It will be a lot more effective. And uh, so, first of all, I want to show you the first part of this debate where Christopher Hitchens is speaking. And I want to emphasize that John Lennox is very intelligent and eloquent and very effective in his response. And I have total great respect for him and for Christopher Hitchens, who's created in the image of God, whether he wants to believe it or not. And so I'm not doing this to try to do something better than what John Lennox has done but because I have a totally different slant to present that's not so much from mathematics, although it does include some mathematics, but <clears throat> includes many fields of science and evidence and other understandings that I feel are very effective and solid in responding to this debate. And because I want to present a very positive message of hope to people that have no hope and feel like there's no meaning or purpose in the universe, no matter what their background is. <coughs> and so we'll just go into that um, debate now, first of all. Would it be to believe this? Suppose you did believe that everything that had brought us here was by design. Uh, well, we know that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed just on this planet have become extinct. So heaven has already watched almost 100% of its creation die off, often in very unpleasant, callous circumstances, with folded arms, right? And that's billions of years of geological time. Some people say the Homo sapiens has been around for 100,000 years, some for as long as a quarter of a million. No one says less than 100,000. Francis Collins, the great Christian believer who did the Human Genome Project, says certainly 100,000. I'll take 100. Richard Dawkins thinks it's more. I'll take 100. What does it mean if we're divinely supervised and divinely created and what looked out for? It means that for 98 or so thousand of those years, humans, homo sapiens, were being born, dying, half of them in childbirth, I would think, life expectancy maybe of 20 years, maybe 30, people dying essentially of their teeth and of hideous diseases, living in permanent fear. Where are the earthquakes coming from? Where are the lightning strikes coming from? Why is all this? Where, where, what are these diseases that hit us? We don't know about microbes, we have no idea. Um, that's to say nothing about the fights with neighboring tribes over women, over land, over meat, over subsistence, the, the, the torture, the, the violence, the cruelty uh, that goes on. Um, I don't need to underline all of it, I hope. You can picture it for yourself. 98,000, first 98,000 years, heaven watches this going on with perfect insouciance. At something like two to three thousand years ago decides, right, we have to intervene now. We have to do something about this. Well, what would be the best way of intervening to try and redeem this rather bleak picture? What about having somebody tortured to death in an obscure part of the Middle East? That ought to cure it. Or if you're a Muslim, what about getting an illiterate epileptic shepherd to start babbling and saying that he's been talking to an archangel? Or what, or what about um, inventing the figure of, of Moses in the, a, a, a mountain that's never yet been found by any geographer of Mount Sinai? That's what you'd have to believe. I've got a minute, right? That's what you'd have to 
believe, and that's why I ask myself, why do the worshippers of this god want to convict him of being such a crummy designer? I'm Michael Jordan. Stop it. Get some help. Most of his creations die off, and the rest suffer miserably, and, and the redemptive offers just don't somehow take, of being cruel and capricious and bungling and, and incompetent. Why? And, and callous uh, as a father. And so, since this is as far as I can get now, I have to tell you why I don't think the idea of an eternal father is a good one in any case when I next get the chance to draw breath. But thank you for staying with me this far. Well, that's a pretty bleak picture of the universe from his perspective, isn't it? Kind of hopeless looking at everything from just a very immediate physical observation, you might say. I mean, even to say that throughout civilization there is so much suffering. It certainly is. There is lots of suffering throughout the whole of civilization. But there's also tremendous beauty and there's tremendous good. And there were civilizations, especially the earlier ones, that were far, far superior to civilizations later on that degenerated. And there's very strong evidence in archaeology and in the writings of many folklores and so on from various tribes around the world showing this degeneration that happened. And when there is that degeneration, there's in superior civilizations with a lot more suffering. But there, are, there were times when man didn't just live for a short period of time. And there were times like the Dark Ages when, yes, there was very short lifespans and so on. And those were the times when man was very corrupt and very degenerate. So I would say that's one thing, that's one point. And there are many assumptions that Christopher Hitchens makes. <clears throat> of course, the whole issue is the question of whether God is good. And that is what I want to show you from many fields of science and archaeology, as well as from understanding and perspective and reason. And Christopher Hitchens states things as if they are fact because certain people believe this and because a lot of people believe this. But throughout history, we see time and time again that the majority are usually the ones that are wrong. Whenever there's new discoveries in medicine and so on, those people are terribly persecuted. Many of them have been martyred and so on, later on to be found to have what really works and what is true. And why is it that it's always the majority that's wrong? So when someone <coughs> says that, oh, because uh, certain famous Christians believe the world is 100,000 years old, therefore the world is 100,000 years old, the assumption is that that is a reality and that is a fact, but it's not. And I will show you the receipts to show how strong and amazing the evidence is that in fact the world, and of course it's a joke among people like that are atheists because they just people, whether they're atheists or not, they'll laugh at them. It's almost like 6,000 years is a swear word. Or oh, the world can't be 6,000 to 10,000 years old. But I can show you the receipts from many fields of science that show the evidence is far stronger that way. And I will go into that in greater detail later. Right now, I'm just outlining an overall view of what Christopher Hitchens was saying and some of the things I want to point out. I have lots of videos with that go to the right locations immediately to show you strong, very strong evidence for the age of the earth, for many other things, for many fields of science. And to view <laughs> that all this suffering would indicate that there couldn't be a God is really drawing a conclusion from a very immediate, confined perspective. 
that is just on the materialistic and physical plane. But modern science has revealed very strongly from particle physics that the physical dimension is one of many other dimensions all the way going up to the tenth and possibly more as shown by mathematical analysis of particle collisions such as the Large Hadron Collider which most people know about. <coughs> which discovered the God particle in 2012. And so I want to show you some of the evidence also, very, very interesting, very strong, irrefutable, empirical evidence showing that there is these other dimensions of existence and that they are far superior to the physical dimension. So that's not being taken into consideration. When you look at at everything that you observe in nature. Yes, you see suffering. You see a lot of things that are terrible. But you see beauty. You see design. You see that everything has a purpose that leads to a greater purpose. And that those things also lead on to a greater and a greater purpose. <clears throat> and so does it make sense that there wouldn't be an ultimate purpose what is it that causes everything to be male and female? Pretty well everything. I mean, you might find the odd creature that's a little different, very rare if there is. But everything has a male and a female counterpart, which is really a picture of beauty and of love and of things that are beyond the mere outward appearance of what we are seeing. Yes, suffering. Yes, death. But when you see the overwhelming empirical evidence from many secular, scientific, highly authoritative sources, it's being ignored. All of these different fields of science. He talked about Mount Sinai. Oh, they haven't found Mount Sinai. That's not true at all. They have found Mount Sinai. And the proof and the evidence is irrefutable. And I will show you the videos showing the proof and the evidence. And that it is really, how can you dispute it? It's right there in front of your eyes. All kinds of evidence. Not only for Mount Sinai, for the Red Sea crossing and the chariots that they dived down, dived down with chariot wheels and everything. And many other things that have been highly verified from archaeology. And that's just scratching the surface. There's a movie that came out in the theaters that a lot of people watched called Patterns of Evidence. Again, showing how people don't want to believe in God, and so they twisted the evidence for the and made a gap of 400 years that this renowned archaeologist David Rowell, who does, who's not even a Christian, showed they ignored. And so it's taught in all the universities around the world, and so they say, well, all of these dates don't fit into the Bible, therefore the Bible isn't true. But when you see that era of 400 years being solved by archaeological evidence, everything lines up that has happened in the Bible, and they've dug all of these places up. They all exist. I could go on. The tomb where Joseph Bones were, and the patriarchs, all there in Goshen. All the evidence is irrefutable for that. And I could go on. There's all kinds of things like that. So there is evidence that there is ultimate purpose, ultimate meaning beyond the mere immediate physical plane of observing what is negative that we see before us. And there is a reason why there is all this suffering that can be well explained. And I do want to explain it here at first in this particular video instead of at the end when I did the other ones. Because I think people need to hear a positive message and then see the evidence that backs up that positive message because that would be more important than seeing the evidence and just trying to win an argument. The, the positive message is so important that answers the question to this suffering and that it's not God that is the source of this suffering. But first, of course, the question must be ans answered about the existence of God to those that choose at this point 
in their lives not to believe in a creator or God. <coughs> and so I want to point out to you, before I get into some of the evidence on life after death and then other evidences on the age of the earth and so on, I want to point out to you that for their... There's the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics basically says that everything left on its own goes in a direction of disorder to greater and greater chaos. And we do see that in nature, don't we? We see all the suffering and the death around us, and of course, that results in all the terrible things that he's talking about. But we also see incredible beauty and incredible design. And when you consider the first law of dynamics, it basically indicates there's no beginning. Of course, people believe in the Big Bang. A lot of people, when the Big Bang Theory came out, were all disappointed because they thought that might mean there's a God that caused it. And of course, now we have the James Webb Space Telescope, 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. And it is shown in 11 points, very strongly, points that undo the Big Bang Theory, so that some of the top proponents and experts and scientists no longer believe in the Big Bang Theory. It's like you're scratching on the edge of a cliff to hold onto it after all the evidence coming out from the James Webb Space Telescope. But what I'm pointing to here is this, is that something always existed without a beginning. If you say there was a Big Bang, what was it before the Big Bang? Something always existed. You say it's some kind of negative and positive thing that happened. Well, that's a form of existence. Whatever it is, there's infinity in the past. So here we are. The second law of thermodynamics says that everything left on its own goes in the direction of disorder. So in the infinite past, we should have come into disorder, not now. We should have already been reduced to total chaos. But no, here we are in a highly organized universe with design in little, a little cell, with machinery in that little cell that is so complex, and it's irreducibly complex because it's machinery, on like, it's like little rotors and all kinds of things that are highly sophisticated, far greater than any AI technology. In, in fact, AI technology is child's play compared to what is in a little cell, which I will show you later on videos back up what I'm saying with facts about what's in those cells. The design in there, you can't say, like some evolutionists say, it has the appearance of design, come on. The, comp the, the intricacy and in the design and the complication and the, of the operations that are going on in those little cells is beyond comprehension. <clears throat> and the information in them that's highly organized. I mean, I won't go into the details now. I'm outlining just different aspects here that point to ultimate purpose and meaning. And so here is something I want to present to you, is if you apply the theory of evolution, which believes in the survival of the fittest, to infinity or to an extremely long time, <laughs> Evolution should have reached its maximum with an ultimate being. It certainly wouldn't be a bunch of beings because sexual reproduction is a highly organized system. It would have probably have been something that evolved before there was a physical dimension, maybe even before there was time. <coughs> you know, applying the theory of evolution. And if it did so evolve to this maximum, that it could possibly evolve to, it would have been the maximum of superintelligence of order that is the God that I will describe in a very scientific way to answer many other questions. So, you have this maxim of being saying hypothetically that it was evolution that brought this maximum being about that would be all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresence, uh, having unlimited authority, power, and life. This being would have power over all the 
laws of the universe, such as time and chance and space and so on, so that it would have swallowed up the need for evolution to exist in the first place because of the apex of how highly evolved it would have become. So that in fact evolution did not exist and order always was. And since order is greater than disorder, since it can overcome disorder, therefore order would always have been and not disorder. And maybe it's hard for a finite mind to comprehend that and conclude that. But actually order would have been always greater than disorder. And I will describe what it is only possible that that ultimate order could be to be able to be entrusted with unlimited authority, power, and life without being corrupted by it or using it in a corrupt way, thus indicative that it is the very source. So that's one thing to consider. Because the other thing that answers the question of suffering is this, and I will do it this way. I will define what the word truth means first in an integral scientific way. If you look up the word truth in any dictionary, it basically means that which is real. It means reality. So you look up the word reality or real in various dictionaries, and it means that which is absolute, immovable, indestructible. Basically, that's what it means, unchangeable. But there's only one quality that could be a reality that is the source of all reality and of all creation and the meaning for which all things consist and exist. So truth is this reality, and this reality is indestructible, but this reality would have to be something that is the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics, that is the destroyer of corruption. And there's only one quality that could be that. And so I will describe it this way. It would be an ultimate perfection and manifestation of love that is the very source of love, now, I'm going to define what I mean by the word love. I'm not talking about, there's three kinds of love in the Greek Bible, um, which is what was originally written in. There's a eros, which is sexual. There's the other one, which is philia, which is feeling. And there's agape, which is the highest form of love. So this quality of love <coughs> is a quality that always chooses the highest lasting good over any lesser choice. Because any lesser choice as such would always have a measure of corruption in it. This love has such purity and such integrity that, as it were, it is a blazing fire of judgment against all that is contrary to love. <clears throat> Only this love that has that quality could be the destroyer of all corruption. Only th and this love would never condone what is contrary in the slightest to this love, and, or it would no longer be love. <coughs> this love represents the negative symbol in nature and in math, which represents an indestructible foundation of reality and represents cutting off all corruption. Remember, everything left on its own goes in the direction of disorder. This quality of love is not like a machine. It is self-originating. It is innate. It is free. Free to choose. And it always chooses the highest lasting good. This love is, in its quality of being, is the highest form of existence. Love is the highest form of existence because it is the highest form of experiencing pleasure. It is the highest form of creativity against the second law of thermodynamics or against corruption. This love is, therefore, 
a quality that will always want to create beings that have the capacity to love because it is ever expanding and wanting to experience love. It wants to experience that beautiful union of marriage with what it creates. And so, it does not create machines. But when you create beings with free will that are the source of their own action, that means they're self-responsible. They're the source of their own action. By their choices, they create their own destiny. And there's the potential to go against this ultimate reality in those choices. And when you bounce off against that ultimate reality in rebellion, it goes in negative, destructive pathways because it is thus cut off from the source or the head. Every body has a head, and if it's cut off from the head, it goes in the direction of disorder, second law of thermodynamics. And so, this love is in its intention wanting to give people the capacity to make choices. But when you make choices, there's the potential to make hell contagious choices that go in a destructive direction. But the ultimate purpose of this love is that these beings that it creates will be restored and brought into harmony with this love and that there will be a point in history where there is this consummate marriage of the creator with his created beings such as us human beings. So that is the first aspect of this love. It is the negative symbol. And it is from the negative symbol that is formed the positive symbol by crossing out the negative symbol. The first act of, a, aspect of this love is its ultimate, per, its perfection. But the ultimate expression of its per, perfection is in the second aspect, that this love is so great that it always had as a reality, not just a capacity, a reality that it could take judgment upon itself for such beings as us that would rebel against it and absorb that judgment without being corrupted by absorbing that judgment. So this love became a perfect atoning substitutionary sacrifice on the cross through Jesus Christ. Oh, that sounds too hard for many people to grasp or comprehend or believe, I suppose, that some man in the middle of history died on the cross. But it's a lot more than that. Because you have to understand that this quality was always a reality in the being of God before the world was even created. Probably, in the inf I would say, in the infinite past. Because it even says in the Bible, which you don't believe in, that Jesus Christ was be slain before the foundation of the world, which means he was slain. It was a reality that already happened before the world was created because God is also beyond time and space. And this is the other thing I want to emphasize here is some people believe that Christians believe in three gods. No, for God to rule and be almighty, he must be in the three ultimate aspects of existence, which are beyond creation as the father, father meaning originator, having control over the end of the, seeing the end from the beginning, beyond time and space, beyond creation, the Father, the originator, the Son, the word Son means expression, the expression of the originator into creation. So the second aspect of existence is in the creation realm to communicate with it as the Son, such as Jesus Christ that came, such as the angels that came to Abraham, of which one of them was Yahweh, and that's in Genesis 18. They sat down and ate together, it says there. And Abraham dresses the main angel, which was actually Jesus Christ, as Yahweh. And of course, the other two go and Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. And there's lots of evidence for Sodom and Gomorrah as well. And so, that's what happened. But we, we see God is not so small that he cannot create, small that he cannot communicate with his creation. And so what I am pointing out here is that, and the third aspect of existence is omnipresence, God and personage as the Holy Spirit. Because to rule in those three ultimate aspects of existence, you must be in and over those aspects of existence in conscious intelligence, in other words, in personage. 
And so there's only one God ruling in the three ultimate aspects of existence. And he condescended and he came into this world through Jesus Christ and suffered more than you a mere creature on the cross. Humbled himself more than you a mere creature on the cross. And his death was foretold hundreds and even up to a thousand some odd years earlier by various scriptures, which was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And no person could have arranged for all of that to have been fulfilled. There's four lawyers that tried to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ by writing books against it, and in the process found the evidence so overwhelming for the resurrection that they were converted in the process. One recent one is Lee Strobel, and there are others. Like I say, four. And there's probably others in history that I'm not aware of. So... This is a very positive message because the ultimate purpose is revealed in the many people that have been experiencing life after death. Do you know that NASA has done experiments that have proven these, the existence of beings in other dimensions? And I will show you that evidence. And so I want to do that now. So it's a very positive message that there is such a love, a love so great. In fact, you cannot imagine a love that is this great, that the Creator would humble Himself more than you, a mere creature, and suffer more than you, a mere creature, so that you could choose to repent and be reconciled to God because He took judgment upon you, your behalf. And remember, the message has always been there. It didn't happen at the time of Christ. The message was from the very beginning of the first people from Adam and Eve, that there's only one God and that only God has the power to forgive. When they put their hands on that innocent lamb or such like animal, as they did with Adam and Eve, it was a symbol of them laying their sin, their sin on the head of that lamb and it was slain. And of course, John the Baptist called Jesus Christ the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But they knew the animal didn't forgive them for sin because it says in such places in the Old Testament, such as Micah 6, that no sacrifice, no even sacrifice of your children to God would suffice for your sins. Only God could be that substitutionary sacrifice because he only could be live out a perfect life without sin, which he did through Jesus Christ. And as it were, he took the first man, Adam, in whom the whole human race existed, and as it were, through his union with the Father in obedience, took him and nailed him on the cross and rose from the dead, absorbing corruption, was seen by 500 people at one time that laid down their lives. And so this is a very positive message that there's ultimate destiny, meaning, and purpose. And I want you to know that before I go into all the scientific evidence that is highly verified and highly backed up. And I want to share that with you now. And so to do that, I am going to minimize myself again. So I'll do that right now. And I'm going to uh, show you some things in a moment here. This is in my book. And this book is titled Afterlife Incredible Irrefutable. You can purchase it on Amazon. 368 page book. Uh, large six by nine and you can get it in digital format as I have here so I've just put the chapters on the side here but look at it says here is it any wonder then that a recent Rasmussen survey by National Telephone an online survey reveals 62 percent of Americans believe in life after death and an additional 20 percent indicate that they are unsure which leaves only 17 percent that do not Okay, that's interesting. Why are so many people believing in life after death? Because of the many scientific studies that have now been done, many former scientists and doctors that were skeptics about the belief that those who physically die enter a very real afterlife existence now believe that it is a very, that it is very real. A study was done on the publications of near-death experiences from 1975 through to 2005 in the video documentary titled The Day I Died. Oh. Mind the Brain. The research paper was by four authors, including two from North Texas University 
and one from Texas A&M University. It also included discussion and interview questions from 45 females and 21 males. In the research paper, they revealed they discovered 55 research teams that have published 65 studies of over 3,500 near-death experiences. These are people that have died while dead, uh, you know, with no heart reading, the heart's not pumping at all, and there's no brain waves. The International Association of Near-Death Studies Incorporated at IANDS.org. <coughs> the largest scholarly organization for near-death studies shows on their website that before 2011, there has been over 900 scholarly articles written on near-death experiences by prestigious scientific journals such as The Lancet, Critical Care Quarterly, American Journal of Psychiatry, Psychiatry, British Journal, Journal of Psychiatry, <coughs> the Journal for Near-Death Studies, Resuscitation, and Neurology. So there's all of that, all of these studies that have been going on. <clears throat> Not only that, there are many atheists that have been known to have physically died, such as Howard Storm, and I forget the names of the others that are in my book right now. And when they came back, they were totally converted. Now they experienced going to hell. But God somehow saw the truth in their heart that they were open to truth and reality, so he had mercy on them, and allowed them also to enter and see heaven because they cried out in hell for God to have mercy on them and to forgive them. And so what, you, that, this, you, these are people that persecuted Christians, that hated Christians that were atheists. And you can watch their, them share that. Now here's another thing about the evidence. NASA did a study. And so I do want to go to that study that NASA did now, which is pretty easy to find on the side here. Uh, NASA Afterlife Experiments, right here. And so it discusses, first of all, the, the experiments here, but we don't need to go into the details of the kind of experiments they did. I just want to go into a part that I may have underlined here. If I didn't underline it, um, I will just simply start to read the part that I know would be uh, the one that would be the most significant, and that's this right here. There is also the well-known skull experiment involving many scientists. They carried out 500 experiments over five years in the Norf Norfolk village of Skull. One of the many kinds of experiments caught images in various ways on camera film. For example, one can view on the internet images received on 35 millimeter film in a light-proof in light-proof containers with no cameras. One only needs to do a search with the phrase skull experiment images. These experiments were repeated in Ireland, Spain, and the United States. In the United States, scientists from NASA, the Institute of Nautic Sciences, and the University of Stanford took part. Scientists witnessed solid being, beings appear. Objects materialize and luminous spheres fly around in an intelligent manner. James Webster, a professional musician with 40 years of experience, stated the following conclusion. I was unable to discover any sign of fraud, and it seems to me that fraud couldn't have been possible, both because of the type of the phenomena observed and by the conditions in which they came about. As the author of this book, and I don't need to, I strongly warn people not to get drawn into communicating with entities and other dimensions of existence, as I have pointed out earlier, the warning in the Bible of such practices. So there is another example of the evidence of life after death. And of course, this goes into many other areas. Um, so I want to show you now in my... F well, I don't really need to go to the flip book. I could go right here to D-World Evidence and show you. There's this particular science, scientist by the name of Robert A. Herman, who's a professor of mathematics at the U.S. Naval Academy and has written a book titled Science Declares Our Universe is Intelligently Designed. 
<clears throat> well, he's also written many other scholarly articles showing these conclusions, but this link here no longer works because he had transitioned from this life into the next from COVID recently. And so now that link doesn't work. But here is what I did. I wrote some of his writings, not from the book, but from another source in my own words here. And I've underlined just a little bit of this. <clears throat> Another part of the D-World model is known as the Grungelin structure, which was originally constructed to analyze and better understand the relationship between the varied states of the conscious and subconscious mind in certain areas of psychology. In fact, this D-World mathematical model was made far more effective by making its superstructure from the G-structure and gave greater position and opportunity for application in various fields. This more effective refined D-World model consists of pages of extensive mathematical machinery that reveal exceptionally substantial evidence that this visible natural world is a small substructure of a far much more sophisticated, elaborate, invisible supernatural realm. What is shocking is that this refined D model clearly establishes that there are informational sig signals that are instantaneous rather than at the speed of light between standard D-world particles and that behind this there is a supernatural mastermind of infinite intelligence. <coughs> In the supermind portion of these particles that identify a mastermind of exceptionally superior mental processes for the production of such highly sophisticated dimensions of existence, it becomes clear that this is a far beyond any mere human or machine brain logical processes to ever be able to produce. <coughs> so, <coughs> even the design of the atomic structure is so complex that there's no way that this just was somehow fell together by chance. You know, big mainframe computers have been used to see if anything would evolve, and it's almost virtually nil the result, if at all. It's pretty well zero possibility that something could evolve out of mere chance, let alone something that is so highly complex and <laughs> you'd have to be denying your own intelligence to say that what is in cells just somehow came together by chance because it's complex machinery. How much more in the atomic structure? And in that atomic structure, it is a fact that 99.49% of what everything that we see and what you're made up of is empty space. But in that minor little sub-percentage, that it has not only the physical dimension, which is far inferior than the fourth, fifth, and so on, all these other dimensions. And one of the most strong empirical evidences for life after death is the fact that when people have been known by doctors and medical equipment to be dead, some for almost up to two hours, with no brain reading, no heartbeat, they have described to the doctors while they were dead exactly what they were talking about, exactly what they were doing on their body. They have described to people, to the doctors and others, what their friends down the hallway were saying at that time, even what people were saying down the road a mile away, and even in some cases it's been highly verified what people were saying a hundred miles away that they saw and couldn't have known. And this repeats itself over and over again so that it's very empirical. How can you deny all of these things and say they don't exist and yet be using your common sense without denying your own intelligence, which you have? Except that we have a misconception of what ultimate meaning purpose is and somehow want to be our own God to the point that we want to deny this ultimate reality. So there is evidence like this that I now want 
to show you. I forgot if I, I got to see if I'm minimized or what here. I think I am minimized still, but I want to make sure. Yep. So um, I'm going to go to um, some stuff now and show you that. I'll just put this. Okay. Yes. Um, and as we were standing there, it had been at least 20 minutes. Uh, you know, I don't know this exact time sequence, but it was close to 20, 25 minutes right. that this man recorded no heartbeat, no blood pressure, um, and the echo showing n no movement of the heart, just right. sitting there. And um, all of a sudden we looked up and the surgical assistant had just finished closing him and we saw some electrical activity. And pretty soon the electrical activity turned into a heartbeat. Very slow, 30, 40 a minute. And we thought, well, that's kind of an agonal thing and we see that occasionally that the heart will continue to beat even though the patient can't generate a blood pressure or pump any blood well pretty soon we look and he's actually generating a pressure no we're not doing anything I mean the machines are all <laughs> shut off and we're stopped all the medicines and all that right. and so I start yelling, get anesthesia back in here and uh, get the nurses. And to, to make a very long story short, without putting him back on cardiopulmonary bypass, heart and lung machine and stuff, we started giving him some medicines and anesthesia started giving him oxygen and Pretty soon he had a blood pressure of 80, and pretty soon a blood pressure of 100, and his heart rate was now up to 100 a minute. You now he recovered and had no neurologic deficit. And for the next 10 days, two weeks, all of us went in and were talking to him about what he experienced, if anything. And he talked about the bright light at the end of the tunnel, uh, as I recall, and so on. But the thing that astounded me was that he described that operating room floating around and saying, I saw you and Dr. Catania standing in the doorway with your arms folded talking. I saw the, I didn't know where the anesthesiologist was, but he came running back in. And I saw all of these post, post-its sitting on this TV screen and what those were, were any call I got, the nurse would write down who called and the phone number and stick it on the monitor, and then the next post-it would stick to that post-it, and then I'd have a string of post-its of phone calls I had to make. He described that. I mean, there's no way he could have described that before the operation because they didn't have any calls. No. Right? And, and he's sitting on, and he's he's, lying on the, so he must have been floating. He was up there. Yeah. He described the scene, uh, things that there is no way he knew. I mean, he didn't wake up in the operating room and see all this stuff. No. I mean, he was out. Right. And was out for, I don't know, even a day or two. Right. While right. we while we recovered him in the intensive care unit. So what does that tell you? 
what does, what does that tell you? Was that his soul? Uh, and here is another one. Company out of Oxford. And I debated a guy with three earned doctor's degrees. He argued that Indies uh, didn't really occur, not in the objective realm. I argued they did. And I summarized evidential cases into, I, I summarized 300 evidential cases into five categories of data. So when someone says to me, what's your favorite or what's the best? I'm saying, well, do you want a really highly evidenced case from inside the room? Because there's a couple skeptics who want them inside the medical room. Then, or do you want them that I think are stronger, the ones that are at a distance, the ones that are on another floor of the hospital, or they're a mile away, or what about ones that are 100 miles away? where they report something that's verifiable. That's a distance one. How about NDEs in the blind, who only claim to see something while they're blind, but have not seen anything before or after the NDE? Now, keep in mind, every one of these, that doesn't make it evidential, because you could say, well, what if the blind person was hallucinating? Just keep in mind, all 300 of these are verifiable. In other words, they're in a state from which they can be thought to die if they don't get help often quickly. But they're, but after we have a record saying they went down in the state, we have data that starts being reported from a half hour later because they're out for, let's say, two hours. And we have data that starts and ends while they're still out. And some of these one source alone has dozens of cases where there's no reported, reported, no reported, no measured brain or heart activity. And there are dozens in that category. Um, what do we do with these? So then there's a couple other categories, too, which I call twilight zone categories that are really weird, but highly evident. So I, there's five categories altogether, 300 evidential cases that I know of. Depends on what the person wants. One of my favorite ones, I'll just tell you two real quickly, and you can see how these uh, how these sound. They're both very brief. In one case, uh, a lady had a near-death experience. She reported being up above her body, and in the room was a medical device that was pretty tall. You wouldn't walk up to it and look on top of it uh, because you can't see on top of it. But she was up above it. And as soon as she came to, as soon as this thing was over, she said, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I have OCD. And she said, whenever I see large numbers, I instinctively memorize them. And there's a riveted number on top of that machine, an ID number, I guess, for the, where this machine is in the hospital. And the number is 673-0233. You know, and, and she gives 12 numbers. She tells the nurse to write the number down. And the nurse does. And a while later, they moved the machine. Before they did it, they sent a guy up there on a ladder who read the number. She got it exactly right. And she told the nurse as soon as she came to. So it wasn't hearsay. It wasn't a year later. It wasn't even a week later. And... It was verified. Now, get this. I know, well, through through a good friend who did the research, I know of the nurse who took the number. And she was so impressed when the number was confirmed, she made the comment that it was the most impressive thing that she'd ever experienced in her entire life. That's one. Here's another one. A little briefer. I think a person that's good was in enough. surgery. I also want to show you a bit of this video because this video <coughs> is um, from Ronald Pearson, who developed the big B, B, big breed theory that has got far less contradictions in it than the Big Bang theory, and um, <coughs> it's from a very non-Christian perspective, but it points out again the reality of other dimensions. And so in this particular topic, 
I want you to just see this for a moment. And so here we go. Do these two worlds interrelate because there's an ether there? That's what we're interested in. It fits in beautifully because it, what it shows is that this structure I'm speaking about, this filamentous structure, is very similar to the neural network of the human brain. Only it's on a very much finer scale, even though it pervades the entire universe. So it has the potential to become intelligent. It also has the potential to become conscious. As soon as consciousness arose, then what I am saying is that the consciousness decided to create a matter system for its own end. And it used the waves which it spontaneously generates to create a matter system. It does so by causing waves to implode from all directions and produce a little spike in the ether. This is a subatomic particle. And the whole thing is organized by waves. Now, this is very interesting because in quantum theory, um, particles, subatomic particles, the bits of the atom, sometimes be behave as if they're particles, in other words, little tiny point masses. And sometimes they appear as waves spread out over a big area. And to this day, quantum physicists cannot explain how this can be. Explanations are given, I grant, but they're all uh, nonsensical arguments, in my view. In fact, the physicists themselves say you cannot use common sense in the quantum uh, domain. I'm saying that this new theory brings common sense back into play and shows that waves make the particles and sort this problem out. So this consciousness in the ether then deliberately designed the matter system so that life could exist of the kind we know. The matter system had to be capable of producing the chemistry, the involved chemistry on which life depends. It all had to be very carefully organized. Like it, almost like the beginning of evolution, as it were, in that way. Yes. Uh, what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that a Darwinian kind of evolution took place not at, at first in the matter at all, but in the ether of space. Before matter ever existed, an evolution occurred, produced a consciousness. Then this consciousness deliberately divided itself into small pieces and then placed it in a matter system which it had created to give it a different kind of experience. It produced an environment for itself to live in. Ah, oh, yes, yes, that I can understand. And also the ability then on the physical death of the body that that part that's connected to the ether, if you like, would return? Am that's I right. right in saying that? It, would, it well, wouldn't return, it would just be there all the time. What's happened is that the matter system has disappeared. The matter, the matter system, the, the atoms of the brain or, and the body, that's been taken away and it simply leaves the mind where it was before. It hasn't really gone anywhere at all. But people's experiences of... Um, uh, we can only learn this through mediumship, and perhaps Michael knows more, has, has spoke to people that have experienced the materializations, or maybe have conversed with people that um, have come back from the other side. But they come back from the other side, or through the veil, if you like, and, and talk uh, of another world there, of a life that they live, in the afterlife, if you like, or in another dimension, or maybe, in your words, in the ether. Why is it that one gets the impression of a structured world, of another world, if, if when the physical body dies, as you say, the matter system that you refer to, and the mind remains after the matter system has degraded, does that move into another dimension? Does it go into a new vibration? Or is it experiencing a, a, another universe within the physical, uh, that yes. I'm not clear uh, I, I can explain. I had oversimplified things slightly by saying when the matter system uh, disappears, bec becomes defunct, that the mind is left uh, as part of the structure of the ether. I was oversimplifying because just as our own matter system can be created, other systems of matter, can, which are either like our own or unlike our own, may look like our only that they're made from subatomic particles, they can be made as well. Provided they are not tuned to the same matter frequencies as ours is, then we shan't be able to relate to them. But they can interpenetrate our own without our knowledge, simply because uh, our matter system isn't solid. 
it looks solid only because um, I think our that's atoms enough. can't interpenetrate each other. I was trying I'll to uh, really simplify the. Now I am going to share with you on the evidence of design in the cells and bring out some very recent discoveries and some discoveries that I'm sure probably Christopher Hitchens doesn't know about and many atheists do not know about. <clears throat> a particular experiment that was done that is amazing. But before I do, I want to show you the design of the cells. So here is this video here. Covered inside the simplest of living things is astounding indeed. As PhD geneticist Michael Denton described, to grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it's 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. Now, part of that bewildering complexity is our topic of conversation, kinesin. Kinesin proteins aren't living things. Rather, they're a family of miniature motor proteins inside living things that transport cargo around inside cells and are remarkably humanoid in appearance. Having two legs that allow them to walk along roadways inside cells and two arms that allow them to carry packages full of important cargo, they're like the postal delivery people, but on a mind-bogglingly microscopic scale. At only seven billionths of a meter long, they consist of, utilize, and synchronize with an incredibly complex array of microbiotechnology that rivals the most sophisticated feats of engineering that humans have ever achieved. Now, there are many different types of kinesin and kinesin-related proteins, each with different specifications and functions that have been discovered in various organisms from yeast to humans. But the following example is a very basic scientific description of what a typical kinesin does and why it doesn't. Inside life forms, proteins and other needed parts must be delivered to specific places within the cell at precise times. Now if the needed part is a protein, for example, a manufacturing plant, called a ribosome, receives blueprints for the part from the nucleus. The information is stored in the nucleus on a strand of DNA, but the blueprint is sent in the form of an RNA copy of that section of the DNA. Now this is obviously a complex coordinated effort, as something must first access the creature's DNA library, unzip it at the exact location needed to copy the specific information required for whatever part is to be manufactured, create a copy of the information for the part, and deliver it to the factory. Afterwards, another organelle in the cell, called the Golgi apparatus, packages the needed part and wraps it in a bag called a vesicle, then imprints the address where the part is to be delivered onto the outside of the parcel. Then a kinesin is summoned, and as mentioned, a typical kinesin has two arms on one end holding the cargo, the vesicle, and two legs on the other end that walk along the roadway called a microtubule. So it picks up the parcel and walks along microtubules in the cell and delivers the parcel where it's needed. Now, if that sounded like a lot of technobabble to you, let's use a more relatable scenario that, although sophisticated, actually pales in comparison to what kinesin regularly do, so that we can better understand the level of complexity at which these micro-machines interact and operate among the other systems inside I think cells. that's enough on this one. From the perspective of data storage, DNA is very efficient since it requires the least amount of material to code for the 20 amino acids. A pinhead-sized piece of DNA has the same amount of information as 25 trillion 189 page paperback books. A stack of these books would stretch 920 times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. 
If you put all the DNA molecules present in your body end to end, the DNA would reach from the Earth to the Sun and back over 600 times. In fact, some scientists are attempting to use DNA's incredible capacity for storage to store data. According to a this next video is really amazing. <coughs> and it's something that I don't think <coughs> most people and probably most atheists and maybe even Christopher Hitchens is not aware of. This is an amazing discovery. We can see of the planet. And in 2011, groundbreaking research suggested something even more impressive. That human residents could be connected to the beginnings of life itself. The breakthrough came at the hands of Luc Montagnier, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who first discovered the HIV virus. The professor was conducting water memory experiments, examining how water could retain a memory of substances that had previously been dissolved in it, when he stumbled upon something that would challenge the very principles of science. All life comes from life. This is a fundamental principle of science and one which has never been violated in any experiment. Life can only exist where life has existed before. And the mechanism for this has always been understood to be a material one, such as egg and sperm or spore and cell division. But Luc Montagnier's experiments have offered a very different hypothesis. The professor showed that DNA sequences the very building blocks of life communicate with each other in water by emitting low frequency electromagnetic waves. Even when the DNA was kept in separate test tubes, the professor still recorded electromagnetic communication between them. How sophisticated could this communication be? Well, Luc Montagnier showed they are able to organize nucleotides, the ingredients which actually make up DNA, into brand new DNA. Science has combined these ingredients countless times before, but in no experiment have they ever been able to recreate the spark of life and transform nucleotides into actual DNA, not without DNA already being present. Life after all can only exist where life has existed before. But in Luc Montagnier's experiments, the DNA had been completely filtered from the water, yet new DNA was still formed. Just how was this possible? So, how had Luc Montagnier managed to achieve what no other scientist could? Now that really does devastate the theory of evolution. That there would be two test tubes, one having DNA in it, another test tube next to it, and the DNA sends frequencies through the test tube, through the air, into the other test tube, and out of nothing, with no DNA in the other test tube, just water, creates life. That totally blows up the theory of evolution out of the water right there. So how do you explain that? How can you draw conclusions without looking at these irrefutable experiments or facts? So there is something to really consider there. And now, now here in this video is a recent discovery that is really amazing. And so I'm just going to let you watch it. And some of you may know about this discovery, but you need to watch this. This is an amazing discovery with DNA. Creation science isn't testable. So despite all the good arguments against evolution, the good arguments for design, all this evidence makes sense from a creationist perspective. No, not good enough, they've said. Again, this isn't my view, this is what they're saying. The whole reason I bring it up, why they demand testable predictions is to show you that no longer applies. Replacing Darwin put testable predictions in print, specifically with regards to human history. I'll read you the sentence, it's a mouthful, and I'll explain it. My model suggests that the history of civilization can be read off nuclear DNA differences among the peoples of the globe, and on a timescale consistent with the Young Earth Creation model. Mouthful of way of saying, like I said earlier, if the Bible is true, if, if, if mankind restarted after the flood with just eight people, 
and the pre-flood world was destroyed by the flood, then that means the history of civilization is all post-flood. We all come from these eight people. And you should be, be able to see the echo of this, the, the Mongol invasion of Eastern Europe, the migration of Central Asian peoples into Europe in the Middle Ages, all that in our DNA. And, and you'll miss all that if you stretch it out over hundreds of thousands of years. And I said specifically the Y chromosome difference is the male inherited DNA. That's what this book represents. It's the answer to 40 year old long arguments against creation science. This book fulfills testable predictions that I made several years ago and makes many more. It sets up a, a, a gigantic new research program of connecting every people group back to specific men in Genesis 10, of uncovering the history of so many other people groups on earth, of confirming other known events of history in this DNA sequence. Or to put it in a nutshell, if you look at the history of the attacks on Genesis, because again, the mainstream account is in, in, in direct contradiction to the, to the biblical account. Christians have sought to defend Genesis. This book doesn't defend Genesis because this book doesn't play defense. It's biblical authority on offense. We've made testable predictions, we've fulfilled testable predictions, and we've got a whole new research program that makes even more. This is science advancing. This is a whole new era of the creation evolution debate, new volumes to be written as a result of this. I'd say we're witnessing the dawn of a new era in the creation evolution debate. So if you're thinking about buying traced, these are some of the reasons why I'd say this is a book, or forget the buying, why this research matters to every person, because every person can connect their, their history to specific men in Genesis 10. We can find the line of the major players in major world religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Here's the genealogical echo, and it actually may get me in some trouble with some of the Muslim community, because right now we don't see a clear echo of Ishmael from as best I can tell. Might still be out there, but there's, there's toes that will likely be stepped on as a result of this. Your ancestry can be connected back to these men. We're writing new volumes in the history of peoples, new events in, in prehistory, so-called prehistory, post-battle, pre-written records. This rewrites race and ethnicity, has new application submissions, has dramatic implications for how we think about the age of the earth. And again, 6,000 years being almost a swear word. Let's avoid it. No, this is, a, this is a very strong argument for it. And this marks the dawn of a new era in the creation evolution debate. This book does all that, again, organically connected to replacing Darwin. There's a simpler version of this in replacing Darwin made simple. And if you want to connect with me, even after this series. Now I want to show you amazing evidence for the age of the earth that really is very strong for a young earth. And people can laugh all they want. It doesn't mean a thing. It boils down to what is real, who has the facts, and who is putting on a charade. And later on, you're going to see a lot of the things that have been set up that are total frauds, that are in textbooks today and being promoted, that are known to be frauds by the things that have been discovered, and yet they're still in all the textbooks and telling people this is the truth or treating it like it's facts. And so we'll take a look now at these things. So um, first of all, we'll go to um, the um, videos here. I'm going to just put this on um, for a moment. Here is a website um, which has on it 104 young earth indicators <coughs> creation.com and you can see the address up there <coughs> and here's where it begins down here <coughs> 104 and these young earth in indicators <coughs> excuse me <coughs> I'm just going to get this out of me.
then I won't cough. These young earth indicators are based on far less presumptions than the dating methods for long ages, which those long ages for all the various leaders were made first, and then they used the dating methods to fit into what they had already developed as millions and millions of years for this layer and so on. But here on this website, you can see many of the young earth and 104 based on less presumptions and the rebuttals to these presumptions by evolutionists often end up resulting in their uh, theories or, or explanations being all the more um, undone in some other area. <clears throat> so there's that to look at. Another area is high scores. People say one of the most strong evidence for millions of years for the Earth is these ice cores, but it's not so. And here's the evidence that shows and the information about interpreting these ice cores that makes that very clear. And it's important that we face all of these facts. So it's very, very convincing. Oh. A lot of people think that you can just count those layers in, in the ice core like we count tree rings. Is that true or not true? In the upper part of the core, you can count the layers. But when you get down further, where they've thinned so greatly, and there's such an incredible difficulty in interpreting all the various information, you cannot count them hmm. as individual rings, particularly visually. And even the chemical compositions and the oxygen 18, 16 ratios and so on, there's a tremendous controversy on that. So basically, you can estimate it for one uh, ice age, but it doesn't go back to hundreds of thousands of years. And you cannot count them as annual layers. There's too much difficulty in interpreting the record. So it seems we have some real differences in the assumptions associated with how we count uh, those layers. Well, if you had a, a considerable amount of precipitation following the Genesis flood, you would have had a lot more precipitation than is normally assumed. Down in the middle of the core, things get so thin that you can't really interpret it correctly. The, the amplitude from the oxygen 18, 16 ratios are almost impossible to interpret in terms of annual layers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, these layers uh, can be easily interpreted as storm layers, not annual uh -huh. layers. So that uh, if you assume that, say you had a storm every three days, you would have 120 of those layers in one year, not just one layer. And so uh, these interpretations are very inaccurate. And so you can't assume that in each individual layer is an annual layer. It's not hundreds of thousands of years. It could be just a few thousand years. Hmm. You love this work, don't you? No, I've done it for years. Here is some more evidence of a young Earth. It totally contradicts the theory of evolution. Dinosaur ancestors and transitions. Over the last few decades, scientists have been discovering soft tissues in dinosaur bones. We're talking about over 50 peer-reviewed secular science journals that have now reported 14 bioorganic materials found in dinosaur bones. They're finding blood cells, blood vessels, connective tissue, and even collagen, which has a maximum shelf life of just tens of thousands of years, with some stretching it out to a maximum of 900,000 years. Either way, with a maximum shelf life of less than 1 million years, what's collagen doing in dinosaur bones that are supposedly 65 million years old? Many dinosaur bones are even found unfossilized in places like Madagascar, Alaska, and Montana. Even the founder of the largest dinosaur museum in the world admitted that usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. Just look at this soft, pliable dinosaur tissue. This type of bioorganic material has been found in the bones of several different dinosaur species. It sure doesn't look like a 65 million year old rock, does it? Even Charles Darwin said, as by evolution theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? And why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. 
and this is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Dar I think that's enough on that one. And then we have all of this amazing discovery in the fossil layers that is not mentioned, or that most do not know about. Museums have some of the most amazing fossil collections in the world. These fossils are typically used to frame the idea of life slowly progressing over millions of years, rather than a worldwide catastrophe being the best explanation. Is this true? Is the fossil record really stacked in a way that proves life evolved on Earth over millions of unseen years? Or does the fossil record provide evidence that the world was covered by a massive flood in Noah's time just thousands of years ago? Actually, the fossil record does not show increasingly complex life emerging over the millennia. What it shows is a record of death in the order that the creatures were buried during the worldwide flood. Think about it for a minute. Genesis 7 verse 11 says that the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open, creating floods and tidal waves that were unimaginable. The Bible says the flood waters increased upon the earth for 150 days until all the high hills under heaven were covered with over 20 feet of water. This process successively buried all creatures outside the ark based on where they lived as the flood waters prevailed, how smart they were, their means and speed of mobility, and their body density. This is precisely why the fossil record generally shows the shallow water marine creatures buried in the lower layers. Then, as the ocean waters rose higher and higher, the suffocated fish were buried, followed by amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and then birds. Dr. Carl Werner spent 17 years traveling to museums and dig sites around the globe, photographing thousands of original fossils and the actual fossil layers where they were found. His research revealed a lack of evidence for evolution theory, including no transitional fossils and clear evidence that shows animals have remained the same over the supposed millions of years of evolution. We went to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. We filmed that the Smithsonian the American Museum of Natural History, we filmed at the Chicago Field Museum, all of the greatest museums of the world, basically, and photographed their fossil collections. Museum Victoria in Melbourne, the Natural Institute in Brussels, we filmed at the New Zealand Natural History Museum in Auckland, and the Red Path Museum in Montreal, Harvard Peabody Museum, the California Academy of Sciences, How many et cetera, different places et cetera. Is there? We went to 60 museums, and Debbie took 60 thousand photographs. Wow. At the dinosaur dig sites, we found examples from every major animal phyla living today buried with the dinosaurs, and these animals look the same. Say that again. It's incredible. At the dinosaur sites, we found fossils, examples of modern animals from every major animal phyla, buried with the dinosaurs, and they look the same. You started out not knowing if there would be any. Zero. And then you found them in every group uh, uh, in the same strata with the dinosaurs. Yeah. And it, it's worse than that. Not only did we find this for animals, then for the plants, we found examples from every major plant division of plants living today, buried alongside the dinosaurs, fossilized, and they look the same as the modern plants. So you photograph fossils from dig sites and museums, and you realize that modern animals live with dinosaurs. That seems too simple. You know, Don, there is a rule in science called the rule of simplicity or parsimony or Oscom's razor that says the simplest explanation right. for a series of problems is usually the correct explanation. So yes, it is very simple. Uh, I love this phrase, simply profound. What you have found is profound by its simplicity, that here are these animals that are just like they are today, and they were there then, therefore evolution didn't happen. According to the fossils that I look at, evolution did not occur. The plants look the same, the animals look the same. Sure, some of the animals went extinct, like dinosaurs, pterosaurs, but extinction is not evolution. The animal fauna has not changed. Look what he found about bats. So now we're going to see amazing artifacts and layers all the way through the fossil record from the Cambrian all the way up to many other layers that should definitely not be there. So here it is. We have the original O.W. Willett print, a Cretaceous rock, 
A series of six prints were found in the mid-1950s, and here we have a pterodactyl print laterally, and we have that being stepped on by a human footprint 11 and a half inches in length. In addition to that, from the Permian, we have a large human footprint. The question is, are these genuine? Spiral CAT scan technique has been used on all of these artifacts, demonstrating that through the rock, the signals that we receive show compression density and show the movement of the foot. These are genuine. From the rock that is assigned an age, according to evolutionary theory, of 110 million years, to rock that is assigned an age 225 million years, and then we have the Meister print, an original sandal print in the Cambrian rock that, according to evolution, is assigned an age of 650 million years. It is a human sandal print with wear on the heel, stitching around the side, trilobite pressed into the toe area, and the overlay material shows a trilobite compressed as well. In addition to that, we have a human handprint from Palo Pinto County in rock that is assigned an age of 110 million years. We have the recorded thumb print and the recorded print of the finger and fingernail and the thumbnail as well in the rock that hardened from the mud. In addition to that, from the Carboniferous period, from the time of uh, the coal, we have this cup that according to evolutionary theory is in material that's supposed to be 400 million years old. In addition to that, we have the iron hammer, the London artifact from London, Texas, in rock that's supposed to be 110 million years old. All of this is symbolized by the icon of the museum, which is the Delk print, an 11 and a half inch human footprint being intruded by an Acrocanthosaurus dinosaur footprint. We have the spiral CAT scans demonstrating that the human footprint is genuine and the dinosaur footprint is genuine. How does this disrupt evolutionary theory? It greatly disrupts According to the it. theory of evolution, All of this shows evidence of a worldwide flood. And the evidence for a worldwide flood is very strong indeed. And so I want to point out some of the evidences for the worldwide flood from a few different sources now. So we'll go and do that right now. I've written an article um, it's well sourced with, of course, all the bibliography and everything. And we read about this. There is 138 similar flood accounts from tribes around the world. <clears throat> Many of these tribes and ancient civilizations that have traditions and records of God destroying the world by a flood because of man's wickedness. Maybe I'll just move this over like that. Within the first decade of the 1900s, before the influence of the West was in most parts of the world, anthropologists were seeking out remote tribes around the world in order to record their local traditions. <coughs> they were diligent to be certain these tribes had no influence from other cultures or from the very few missionaries that were just at the beginning of a massive spread around the world. Out of the various books that publish these oral traditions, there is a massive three-volume work, Folklore, by Sir James Fraser, published in 1918, that brought all this work together. It includes 138 flood accounts from all parts of the world that have striking parallels with the biblical account of a worldwide flood. There are seven major points on which these accounts almost all, without exception, agree on. <coughs> First, there was a moral cause for the flood by intelligent beings. Second, that one man received advance notice of the flood by a god or an animal. Third, there was the universal destruction of the human race and all living things by water. Fourth, that some kind of vessel was used to provide deliverance and shelter. 
fifth, the seed of mankind is preserved to perpetuate the human race. Sixth, that animals played a specific role by warning of the flood or by indicating when the waters abated and there was dry land. <coughs> Seventh, that only a few that were personally warned and re responded actually escaped. These are many races, there are many races today which possessed traditions of the flood. Some examples in Europe are the Greeks, Welsh, Icelandic, Lithuanian, and Finnish legends. In Asia, there is the Persian, Chinese, Burmese, Filipino, and Hindu legends. In North America, there is the Alaskan Eskimos, the Algonquins, Iroquois, Hurons, and Apaches. In Central and South America, there is the Pre-Columbian Mexican, the Caraguans, Brazilians, and the list goes on. Need I mention them all, including the ancient Babylonian accounts, etc., etc. <coughs> Josephus talks about the world wide flood and how Nimrod, which is about 15 feet tall, said, I will take vengeance on God for the flood. And he was a type of the Antichrist that ruled the world at that time. He was very intelligent and very enormous in size. But those are some example, evidences there. Now, if you want to get this book, you can get this book for free. And so I will click on where you go to get that book right here. This is the archive.org site, and you can see the exact address right there. And here is where you can download the book. You just come down here, and you can get it in PDF or maybe even in full text or EPUB. It's up to you, and you can download that for nothing. So there is some very strong evidence right there for the worldwide flood. And of course, there's a lot more evidence that I can show you, and maybe I will show you some of that evidence if I can find the um, proper um, reference that I did probably, well, I don't see it here, so um, I will just um, simply go to um, where it probably is in my Kindle book on the worldwide flood, but it's not that important. I'm going to go on to show you something else. What I want to point out, though, about data, I want to just talk a bit about the dating methods right now, um, briefly. Um, I'm just doing this by memory, although I have writing on this, but I don't want to try to find the writing right at the moment. Um, <coughs> the dating methods, you got rhodium, strontium, uranium, lead, and many of these other ones uh, that are used. And basically, you're measuring the dating because there's a certain amount of time for uranium to decay into lead and so on and so on. And proportional with all these dating methods is the speed of light that they believe is constant. And yet the speed of light is not really shown to be constant. Um, and there are many things that can change the dating and such things are a nearby neutrino explosion. Lightning, obviously, which there would be a lot of, would change the speed up. It would make it speed up to millions of years when it's probably way, way less than that. And there's uh, the reversal of the Earth, Earth's magnetic field that does that, which did happen and could have sped it up greatly. All of these things are presumptions. And the other presumption is that you assume that from the core of the earth, it came up with just the uranium and then it decayed into the lead. And an example of this is when your dating methods were used at Mount St. Helens, they showed millions of years, when in fact it was only 30 years old. Now I can go to the sources. I don't have time in this video to go to those sources. So all of this points towards very surmounting evidence for a young earth. <laughs> and I could go on talking about how layers are in many other orders that are not according to what evolution says they should be in in different parts of the world. Some massive areas that are, I believe, over a thousand miles. And so even the way the earth folds and there's all these folds in the layers that could never happen unless they were soft, 
There's valleys that could never be formed unless it was by hydrology. And hydrology experts know that all of the paradigm that fits properly for the greatest evidence for what happened in the world is not evolution, but it is a massive flood because all of these fossils are found buried together like water, moved them all into, so you got sea creatures mixed up with animals and mostly in high locations because they were fleeing from the rising waters. So one could go on with evidence for the flood, but I wanna show you some more things now. So I'm gonna minimize myself again and show you some more things um, here on the evidence of the flood, not on the evidence of the flood, on something else. So um, I'm just going to uh, do that now. There was a famous book that was very popular and a lot of people were purchasing called The Mysterious Origins of Man. And then there was a movie made on it by NBC TV. And so you can read here what happened. Because of the powerful impact of Mysterious Origins of Man, NBC TV special documentary had on the public around this book, it moved the scientific community to lobby the Federal Communications Commission to find and censure NBC. On YouTube, you can watch this video documentary titled The Mysterious Origins of Man, the History Channel. It is obvious that this then exposed the cover-up of these establishment scientists and threatened their exclusive monopoly on intellectual authority, funding, and social prestige. And so it is that throughout history, people conglomerate around certain things that they believe to be true, such as the theory of evolution. And because it provides financial security and pride and prestige, they feel threatened when greater discoveries come along. And this is an example of what evolutionists do because of the tendency for human nature to be corrupt and not want to face reality and face the truth. And so this is one example of it. And so I want to show you that origins of man uh, movie, not to watch it, obviously, but to show you that it is there for you to look at. And so I will do that now. Or maybe you had a big ape and a human being living together in Java about a million years ago. The important point to make about the Java man discovery is that it's based on a speculative leap in which two pieces of evidence are put together in a way that's not really warranted. At the end of his life, Dubois realized that the skullcap belonged to a large ape and the leg bone was from a man. Nevertheless, Java Man was prominently displayed at the Museum of Natural History in New York until 1984. Since then, it has been removed. Today, museums all over the world display models of yet another skeleton they call the missing link, the common ancestor of both man and ape. Lucy, you know, the famous Australopithecine, uh, discovered by Donald Johansson. He says she was very human-like. But I was at a conference of anthropologists where many of them were making a case that she was hardly distinguishable from an ape or a monkey. These bones have been restored to resemble a missing link, part human, part ape. And Lucy is now thought of as being our long lost ancestor. But this is merely an interpretation, the interpretation of one group. Those same bones can be, and they have been taken by scientists, and identified as simply an extinct ape. Nothing to do with us at all. So this gives an example of some of the stuff that is in that movie, The Mysterious Origins of Man, which is not from a Christian perspective, but sh shows evidences of very superior civilizations and of other sources that contradict the theory of evolution. So we go on. Now I want to show you some outright forgeries. Uh, process happens in the womb. There's no evidence for that, is there? Absolutely not. Yet, 
uh, on the screen, you'll notice a, a picture that is probably very familiar to a lot of the viewers out there. This one was, was drawn by a fellow by the name of Ernst Haeckel, and basically put these embryos, he would say, suggest evidence for evolution. I remember that from my eighth grade science textbook. Oh, by it's, the way. it's still very, very popular in textbooks. The way we read it, if you look down here at the bottom, this would be a, a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, a couple of mammals. And finally, over here at the end, we have a human at three different embryological states. His point being that early on, up here at this top row, he would say that all creatures, whether it be a fish, a salamander, or a human, that were basically all the same. I mean, if you look across there, there's not a whole lot of difference. He, in fact, said that his turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. And yet we know today Ernst Haeckel lied. He actually forged those images I just showed you. On, on this particular screen, you'll notice Haeckel's embryos are at the top, and the real picture is there at the bottom. In fact, Haeckel uh, was, uh, was disciplined as, as a uh, professor for lying, right? Yes, he was. In fact, uh, he... The, the story goes that he was kicked out of the University of Jena. You know, we've known literally for centuries now, he lied in his pictures, and yet they keep showing so, up. So who's the bigger liar? The man who drew the pictures in the first place knowing they weren't true, or the people who have continued to perpetuate the lie to our children when they knew it wasn't true? That's right. And even evolutionists admit it. And Natural History uh, magazine in the year 2000, Stephen Jay Gould, very well-known evolutionist, he commented on Ernst Haeckel's embryos. I want you to look at what he said. He said, we should therefore not be surprised that Haeckel's drawings entered the 19th century textbooks, but we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling <laughs> that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not majority, of textbooks. That, that phrase, century of mindless recycling of lies. Yes. You know, we did a show, uh, another show on indoctrination, and it just says to me, you know, if you're looking for truth, you don't reproduce lies. Right. But if you're trying to perpetuate a theory for which you have no evidence, then you don't care if it's true. You just care if kids believe it. That's right. And that's what they're doing now. That's right. Sir Arthur Keith, in commenting on, on embryology, uh, he said it was expected that the embryo would recapitulate the features of its ancestors from the lowest to the highest forms in the animal kingdom. Now that the appearance of the embryo at all stages is known, the general feeling is one of disappointment. The human embryo at no stage is anthropod in appearance. The embryo of the mammal never resembles the worm, the fish, or the reptile. Embryology provides no support whatsoever for the evolutionary hypothesis. If you look at the date when Sir Arthur Keith made this comment, it was 1932. Yes. We knew embryology provides no support whatsoever for evolutionary hypothesis, and yet we're marching it years later. We're marching it's still it out. the best thing we got, and we know it's a lie. Isn't that incredible? And you ask yourselves, are we, are we still putting in textbooks? Definitely. Yeah, it, it's absolutely damning evidence. So here is even a greater forgery that people totally think are facts and are far from facts. It's a total lie and forgery. A technical disclaimer relating to the Nebraska man as being in the human lineage was issued. However, the mass propaganda served to build a mindset of man descending from lower life form. It served its evolutionary purpose. Now, here is a very popular publication. Look at it very closely, of course. There is at the bottom Ramapithecus, who has in the last 20 years been demoted to just being another ape. Australopithecus, just another ape, but Lucy is included in that. Homo habilis, Homo habilis, that's just a catch-all for a bunch of fragments throwing human bones, ancient human bones, and uh, uh, lower primate bones all together. There is no skeleton involved. Sinoanthropus, and all they had was the report of some skulls in China Nothing but a report. All the originals are gone. They were supposedly transferred to Germany. The originals are gone. There's no evidence. Yet, here they're publishing all of these in our descent. Pithecanthropus, Pithecanthropus erectus was the Java man. 
turned out to also be uh, the skull was the kneecap of an elephant. But that's officially, you need to come for every one of the lectures this year and get all the facts. Hesperopithecus, I've heard of him. There he is walking quite upright. Who's Hesperopithecus? Nebraska man. What is he really? That's the tallest pig I've ever seen. Well, maybe that's a feral hog. That's the funniest looking pig I've ever seen in my life. That's just a, an ape face on a human body, a little long on the arms. Hesper, the guy was a pig. You know what I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? We need the facts. The facts are not being presented. There is an agenda to uh, disturb the human mind, cloud our past, and discredit the word of God. That's what Charles, oh, Charlie boy, intended to do. He, he said, I feel like I've murdered God, and he was proud of it. He literally wrote that he had murdered God. So there's Hesperopithecus. Next to him, Doug, can you read that guy? The one who is between Hesperopithecus, the pig man, mm -hmm. and the Neanderthal, smarter than we are. Who's the guy in between? Eanthropus. Uh, anybody ever hear of Eanthropus? Who was Eanthropus? His, uh, yeah, the, yeah, right. Piltdown Eanthropus Dawsoni, the Piltdown man. A total fraud, known since 1953, and yet this... Charade Parade is being carried in a lot of publications worldwide. Uh, something's going on, something fishy in Denmark. Now I want to show you the um, evidence from Mount Sinai, but a lot more. This is the Red Sea crossing. And so here we Beach have it. Where the waters opened up, we're standing at the exact spot. Wow. Yes, and the mountains of Saudi Arabia in the distance. Did your knees get weak sitting there? Was it a, <laughs> was it a, a, an awesome thing to behold? It was quite old? incredible, yes, to, to be there. Mm. And so in the foreground, right in front of us here, is a melted beach where the sand and the stones were literally melted together like concrete. Really? This is not loose sand. This is a melted beach which the pillar of fire created when it stood here. So Separating the Egyptian army yeah. from the fleeing Israelites. Yeah. So again, this is more evidence you know, that confirms the location My here. My goodness. Now, how did you find out about that? I had heard about it, and then I, I saw it myself. You know. So here it is. You see this rock is just infused in with the sand and the little rocks there. And this is all hardened. This is like concrete. That and is amazing. Jason here stepping on it. It's, it's very solid. This is a different area. How did the locals explain this? I asked the local, the hotel owner was here with us that we know, and he says, I've never seen this before. You know, he said his hotel's in a different area, but you know, he was amazed at what he saw. So, uh, well, there's the evidence right there. It's yeah, solid. Right. And so a piece of it was broken off for us to look at. And you can see up close here, all the little rocks and the sand, they're melted together, infused wow. by the pillar of fire. And this goes on for some ways. This isn't just one little spot. And so Ron Wyatt went, went scuba diving out there, and various things have been found in the water. You can see human femur bone that is coral encrusted, which would be something you would expect. And on the left here, we see a normal one on the right you see the coral encrusted femur from one of the soldiers. On the top left, you see a human rib cage stuck in the coral. Now, what about people who say, oh, this is just, this is table coral? It's, it's just... It, it's not, because it has metal in it. And so here's a horse's mm. hoof. It's shriveled up when they took it out of the water. Mm -hmm. It's shriveled up. So, again, we have horse parts, human parts. What are we seeing here? What is this coral? Uh... And so this is coral standing on an axle, and it has a raised center hub with spokes going outwards. Here's another 
round chariot with a race center hub and then spokes going out and it's got a round shape to it. Again, it's covered in coral. Some people say that these are just modern shipwrecks. Some people have said that, but again, this agrees totally with the design of the chariot wheels. Mm. With the race center hub and using metal detectors, there is metal in the center. There are spokes going out. This is a four-spoke wheel with three spokes left. Four-spoke wheels, six-spoke wheels, and eight-spoke wheels are found here. Mm. Of course, using the metal detector, like he's demonstrating here, all the hubs here contain metal, and that is the design of the Egyptian chariot wheel with the metal center hub. Now, here is a gold-plated wheel. There were 600 choice chariots used in the Exodus, we're told. So you would expect to find 1,200 um, chariot wheels here with gold. And this one is special. It's gold-plated. And two or three of these were found by Mr. Wyatt. Hmm. Now we see a more shallow area where the Red Sea crossing took place. It's shallower here compared to the north and compared to the south. It's still deep. It has to be a deep area. It's 2,800 feet deep, but that gives you a 4% grade, which is manageable. Over in Saudi Arabia, you see the remains of the pillar uh, that was found there on the Saudi Arabian side. It was cut down by the Saudi authorities. It had Hebrew writing on it. We don't know where it is. But there in the Saudi waters, Vivica Pontin went scuba diving, and she found this beautiful chariot wheel in the Saudi Arabian waters. So you have chariot parts on the Egyptian side, chariot parts on the Saudi Arabian side. So but it's not the crossing site. It couldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the critics would say. But, uh, you know, the evidence is here. It's real. So we rented a boat and went out with a Rove, a remote-operated vehicle. Uh, had a 100-foot tether, and so we were going to do some little inspecting ourselves. So for this is a submarine camera? Yes, for okay. a few hours, and we didn't have days and weeks to do this. We had a few hours. We rented a nice boat here to take off. We headed down toward the south end of the beach. We're headed toward that area, and you can see the waters uh, extending over to Saudi here. Arabia in the distance. That's here is video on the real Mount Sinai. Clear, strong, very strong evidence. Uh, the mountain is the front of Mount Sinai, and you can see in the distance the blackened peak mm. of the mountain. Uh, once again, the Bible says that the mountain was a smoke. It was on fire. And so the mountaintop here is, on, is blackened. When you walk up to the top of the mountain, several people have. You turn the stone over, the top of it's black, the bottom of it is brown. Really? So there's evidence that it was burned on top, and the natural color is on the bottom, and it's brown. Now that answers a question I was going to ask, and you've already answered it, because I have heard a, a secondary theory that this is just a different type of rock. It's a black rock that happens to have this, this, uh, this line uh, right at a certain point uh, near the peak. Yeah. But that's not the case, yeah. This is a burned mountaintop hmm. because underneath it, you know, it is brown material. So it's actually a day hike to make it to the top of the mountain and to make it back down, uh, you know, strenuous walk. But people have been up there and they've seen the blackened, uh, burned. And that is the tallest mountain in the area. It is. The upper two-thirds of Saudi Arabia is the tallest of mountains. And that's another clue that ancient historians have said that it was a tallest of mm. mountains in Midian, and that's what it is. Here it is from Josephus. We were just looking at that now. Uh, so yeah. Josephus said that Mount Sinai was the highest of mountains in the, in the city of Midian, which is just outside of Albad. Yes, Albad is 15 miles to the south. Okay. And Albad is where Jethro is from. On some maps, you'll see the name Jethro next to Albad. Father and Moses. the uh, caves of Moses are there also. Um, at Albad. And, so. it, and also uh, Philo said that Mount Sinai was located east of the Sinai Peninsula and south of Palestine, which yes. puts it again in this right. vicinity. Again, we're in the correct location. So you have all these ancient historians identifying the site, and you have the Bible saying hmm. uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia, Galatians 4. So it's pretty incredible. It's been lost for so many uh, millennia and yet here it is coming out in, mm. near the end of time for a de demonstration of truth for mankind. 
So Exodus 19, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. My friend Aaron Sin was out there around 2003 with Tim Mahoney, and again you can see the blackened peak in the background, and at the base of the mountain, we'll see a little bit later, is the remains of an altar, uh, once again fitting the biblical account. You can see a guardhouse on the right edge of this photo. They put a fence around the front of the mountain and a guardhouse and a sign telling people to stay away. This is an archaeological area. So the Saudi authorities are recognizing this as an archaeological site. Well, having put that much effort into it, they know. Yes. They know darn well sure. what this is. Sure. And then another photo here from a distance further back from the mountain. You can see, uh, again, the encampment area. And the left side of the photo in the distance, that's an area where Elijah's cave is. And here in the very center of the photo is Elijah's cave. It's uh, in a shadow, but it's in the, kind of the very center of the photo here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, Elijah, arose. He did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the man of God, and he came thither into a cave and lodged there, 1 Kings 19. Now, how many people would catch on to that, that this is the same? Because we hear of Elijah's cave, but we, normally you wouldn't tie the two together. You wouldn't stop at Mount Horeb. Oh, yes, that's right. That's, this is the same place. You know, it's funny right. that it's just all in the right. same area. Everything matches here, you know, the biblical account. And this is taken from inside the cave, and we're looking out into the valley below. This is quite a photograph here. Mm, wow. Now, that is, there in the photo, you can see the, that's the Saudi government's buildings. Is it not? Well, actually, those are Bedouin buildings. Bedouin out buildings. The now, this one is on the rock that split open from which vast volumes of water flowed. Our next slide here, we can see Tim Mahoney in the foreground, <laughs> and in the background, uh, you can see the split rock, the first split uh, rock. Yes, okay. So we went from the second one back to the first one here. And, of course, Tim Mahoney, he is with the website PatternsofEvidence.com. They're putting together a documentary on this and the Red Sea Crossing. But you can see in the distance the split rock on top of a 300-foot-tall hill. The split rock is 50 feet in height. It's a very prominent rock. Now, in Numbers 2011, and Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and a congregation drank and their beasts also. So God provided for them. He gave them provision and... Water for a million people. Uh, yes. And probably several million yes, animals. Yes, probably three, you know, three million people, yeah, plus their livestock. So some people have been able to make it over there. The country is closed. You cannot get a tourist visa. So to get into the country is very difficult. And then getting out to the site, you have to have permits usually just to get to that area. But uh, here you can see the split rock where you can see a large amount of water erosion, a large amount of water erosion coming down from the rock. In the foreground here, you can see channels being cut into the rock. The water has eroded the, the rock to a smooth surface here. And this is the rock that in modern Western times that uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell, I mean, the Bedouin have always known this is, this is here. Mm -hmm. But this is where uh, ben, uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell discovered this one. Yes. After Ron discovered the mountain, Jim and Penny went out there, and they also found this rock. Uh, but uh, so very, very large rock. The split in the rock is so large you can actually walk through it. Mm. You know, and a large amount of water erosion inside the rock itself. Here you can see how it stands out prominently above the peak there. And so here you can see the split in the rock where a person could walk through it. When God split it, it sure split, and then the water erosion coming up out of there, spewing up, it created more space probably in the rock, eroding it away. And you can see water erosion coming down from the rock. Yeah, and even if you saw this and you were a skeptic and said, well, that rock has always been split, or it's just a, it's a natural outcropping, and that erosion is wind erosion, well, you're not gonna have wind erosion da flowing down 
uh, in a pattern similar to what water would create. Yes, this is definitely water erosion coming down. Again, this is a desert area, very little rainfall at all out here, and yet all this water erosion you can see on the rocks coming down from this giant split rock. So God did provide hmm. water for them lovingly, even though they were impatient and rebellious, <laughs> kind of like us, I guess. I aren't we all? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So in our next slide, you can see Ross Patterson. He's standing uh, next to the split there in the rock. Now, those who are not familiar with Ross Patterson, uh, who, who is he in relation to He's all of this? He's a friend of mine in New Zealand who okay. also promotes Ron White's work. Oh, very he good. Some presentations, and he was able to make it out there. And so our next slide, we can see the altar Jehovah Nisi in the foreground. Mm. Um, and in the background, we can see the split rock once again standing up very prominent rock in the background. and uh, So this is an altar of some this kind This is mentioned here. in the Bible, mm -hmm. yes, this altar. So again, this is matching the biblical account once again. And there's also some circular rock formations. I don't know if they held the bottoms of the tents down or something, because mm. you see some round rock formations where the children of Israel were encamped in this so that's, area. That's similar to what we find in North America with the, uh, the Cherokee Indians uh, and, and such across the country, that in certain areas where they would camp, they, they, there's these circles where their tents were Okay, yeah, uh, at different piece, times yeah. of the year. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So over on the other side of the mountain is the front of Mount Sinai, and you can see in the distance the blackened peak Mm, of okay. the mountain. We already saw uh, that. Once again, the okay. Bible says that the mountain was a smoke. It was on fire. And so the mountaintop here is on, is blackened. When you walk up to the top of the mountain, several people have, you turn the stone over, the top I of it is black. The now this is the website that they mentioned patterns of evidence where they are doing Documentaries, Patterns of Evidence. Evidence has been a powerful documentary movie that has been played in multitudes of theaters across Canada and the United States and probably many other parts of the world. And they have trailers on here that you can look at as well on various movies of other things confirming many other discoveries that confirm that these things that are described in the Bible are actually real. And I think I might have already mentioned uh, the renowned archaeologist David Roll, who is not a Christian, who has confirmed many of these discoveries and exposed the deception of those that do not want to believe in God, that refuse to acknowledge a 400-year gap and therefore say that they can't find the biblical accounts. But when you look at that 400-year gap, which is solved in Patterns of Evidence, which is a movie, you see that all the biblical things are all there. The destruction of Jericho and all these various places that are described. Many other places. Here's the trailer, for example, of the Red Sea crossing. Just a little bit of it. searching for evidence of one of the greatest miracles of the entire Bible, the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. Tim, the first question most people ask is, so, where's Mount Sinai? I can't go in My first question as a geographer is, where was the sea that was parted and crossed? So what do you think the crossing site, where would that be? Well, for once, I'm going to follow the conventional argument here. When I look at the Exodus story through the eyes of a scientist, then it contains a lot of observations. I don't think I'll go into the trailer for time on this video. You can check that out, Patterns of Evidence. There's many movies they're developing that are highly confirmed with the evidence in archaeological discoveries. And I could go on to tell you about even more amazing archaeological discoveries, which you will find in my flip book at Ultimate meaning.com so I should go to that flip book actually and show you that flip book that you can look at for free and go to these other links so I'll do that right now this is my website 
ultimatemeaning.com where you can look at these things. This is the flip book here. You can enlarge it <coughs> and you can um, turn the pages and the print that is in red are links to YouTube videos showing evidence from many fields of science and archaeology of the things that I am sharing here and more because it's in the archaeological section, I have discoveries of other things uh, that have to do with the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant and so on that are very amazing. <coughs> and there are, of course, many other links on my website there. So I want to say in closing that the evidence is overwhelming for what I have shared, that there is destiny and ultimate purpose and meaning for your life. The very meaning of all things is an ultimate perfection and manifestation of love that is the very source of love and of all beauty, and of all that is good. And it will prevail. An ultimate destiny when you shed your body, your physical shell, is either in a place of eternal torment because you choose to totally resist this love, which why I would never understand why someone would. God is very merciful to do everything to bring people to come into a place where they truly, from their heart, recognize the truth, which is this love that is so pure, and so integrous, and yet so filled with mercy and love that God himself would take judgment upon himself for you. There is nothing, there is no love that can be imagined that is greater than this love, or that could exist that is greater than this love. Only this love could be entrusted with unlimited power and life and authority without being corrupted by it or using such unlimited life, power, and authority in a corrupt way, thus indicating he is the very source of love. And all you have, and if you want, you can pray a prayer by going to my website at ultimatemeaning.com, which I've showed you, and hitting the contact link where there's some prayers with music in the background or just pray on your own from the depths of your heart and mean it. And if you mean it, Christ promised this. He said, whoever believes with their life into me, out of their innermost being, would flow rivers of living water. That's not physical water. That's the water in another dimension, flowing out of the inner core of your being. <coughs> Only this will satisfy the inner core of your being. Only when you have the ultimate source of reality and dwelling in you, which is this love from which flows life and wisdom and intelligence. You were created with a God vacuum, and nothing can fill that vacuum. One can choose to believe a lie to justify being their own God and become a slave to various baits of temporal pleasures that can be manipulated by other greater powers to manipulate your life in a course that leads to destruction. Or one can choose to truly repent and ask God for forgiveness of all sin and make God the one true God, which is described in the Old Testament and the English Bible as Lord God often, and the word Lord in the original Hebrew is Yahweh, which means the ultimate reality that is separate and above and beyond all creation, which is this love. And the other word for God in the Hebrew, is Elohim that literally means the Almighty's in plural, referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so you can be reconciled to God because he poured out his blood onto death for you and had his body suffer great humiliation and pain onto death more than you've ever suffered, more than you've ever been humbled, so that you can receive his love and his forgiveness. And then a process begins. 
of growing into a closer and closer love union with God. Where the corruption is unraveled, the deception over time, and your identity grows and grows in God. And so please email me through my website if you've received Jesus Christ into your life through this video or through whatever else that you've seen on my website, ultimatemeaning.com. <coughs> this is a message to all peoples from all backgrounds. And it was a response <coughs> to those <coughs> such as the atheists who would seem to have no meaning or purpose in their lives and to cause people not to have meaning and purpose in destiny when everything in nature and creation points towards ultimate meaning and purpose. So thank you for watching this video.